Here we go. Here we go. At our church, Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts, and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all. It's His. And we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church. Beginning with verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but as the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished." Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you, that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if, you, if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you 
that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Go give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues or, and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that you that your giving may be done in secret then your father who sees you who sees what is done in secret will reward you and when you pray do not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others truly i tell you they have received their reward in full but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who, is, who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This is then how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure, treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where the thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. 
Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you add a single hour to your life by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And all God's people said, amen. There's a lot here, and so how am I going to fit all this in in a 25-minute message, 30-minute message? Well, we're going to look at the major theme of what we just read within the Sermon on the Mount here. Last week, we talked about the Beatitudes, and, and we talked about this idea that the Ten Commandments that were given from, the Mount, from Mount Sinai were the thou shall nots given to us, all the things that we should not do. Jesus redefines what God's aim is by reestablishing who we are. So last week we talked about instead of it, the thou shalt not, thou shall be. Who we are called to be in Christ, that we are set apart and that we are called to become a new creation. And so Jesus moves on from that teaching after truly establishing our identity and the kingdom priorities, recognizing that God's priorities are very different than our priorities, that who God values and who God is lifting up are not the people that we would lift up and not the people that we would value, that God values us in our brokenness. He values us in our desperation God invites the humble, God invites the broken, God invites the sinful, he invites all of us into his kingdom and he is seeking after each and every one of us and that's what we get out of the Beatitudes. But now Jesus begins to get into a whole series of teachings that if you you sit there and look at those teachings, it's no wonder why we ignore those teachings. It's much easier to talk about the thou shalt not than it is to talk about, well, now that I'm a new creation in Christ, what's this all about? Well, it really gets summed up at the end of that. All that I read got summed up in that Matthew 6, 33 passage. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added unto you. Everything else, all these other things, all we have to do is seek after God, to seek after his face and not just his hand. You know what I mean by that is that we tend to go to God in prayer and seek after him for God to do something for us. We need something else from God to make us content rather than recognizing, as we see here, that everything that we have comes from God, belongs to God, and goes back to God, and God's got it. God's got the whole world under control. It may seem like mayhem, but God is still on the throne. Now to understand the Sermon on the Mount and put this in context is that Jesus is again inaugurating a new kingdom. He's not inaugurating a religion. He is not inaugurating a kingdom that is manifested by a physical king and a physical kingdom, but rather he is creating a kingdom that is radically different than this world's kingdom because it has a king that is radically different than anything that we have ever seen on this world. Jesus tells us in John 18, 36, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. His kingdom is from another place. But every time we pray that Lord's Prayer, what are we saying? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when we say that we want his will to be done and his kingdom to come, 
where does Jesus say his kingdom resides? He says that his kingdom isn't found in a physical location. It's not found in bricks and mortar, but rather his kingdom is found within our hearts. His kingdom is found in the people of God. And as his government and his reign increases in our lives, so then shall his peace and his joy and his righteousness. But we have to come under the authority and the lordship of Jesus Christ and understand that it is not a matter of all these do's and don'ts. Because here's what Jesus did by talking about the Sermon on the Mount. See, the, the Pharisees and everybody there, they were all the experts of the law. They were all listening in on this sermon that Jesus is teaching. And Jesus says, you've heard it said this, but I tell you this. How many times did you hear that over and over? He says, you heard it said. You've read it. You know it. But I'm telling you, we're going one step further. Because here's what happens when, any t when we have any type of rules or anything. One, we always try to find a way around any rule. Anybody there with me? All right, you try to find a way around any rule and you excuse in action. We complicate what is simple and we, and we just, right? Jesus says if someone wants something from you, to give it to them. And what do we do? Oh, they're not worthy of it. They might use it for drugs. I like that one, right? Yeah, people go, you know, somebody asks you for money, they might use it for drugs, pastor. Well, did you go get them a hamburger? No, but you know, did Jesus put an asterisk by what he said? Did he say, do this, but unless you have some good justification. Jesus lays out kind of this major charge for all of us. He lays out a charge that says, you know what, basically here's what he's saying. You missed the point. If you think that you got the point, you missed it. If you think that you're so righteous by following the letter of the law, well here I'm going to tell you what the real matter of the law was all about. See, you think just because you're not committing murder, you're good, right? It's like, I like this where, you know, the husbands that, that treat their wives like garbage and they say, well, I'm not hitting her. I go, oh, well, I guess we've kind of lowered the standard there. Or if people say, well, I'm not that bad, I'm not, it's not like I'm Hitler, well, way to go by lowering the standard to the, probably the lowest common denominator you could get to. Very few people are comparing themselves to Mother Teresa, but we'll be more than happy to compare ourselves to Adolf Hitler because we're going to look like a saint compared to him. But Jesus is saying this whole idea, this game that you play of comparing and contrasting and picking the rules and elevating what rules are more important than this rule, that is irrelevant when it comes to the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is not about rules. It's not, that's what Paul says about, he says it's not about eating and drinking and doing the right things. But it's a matter of allowing righteousness and peace and joy to be manifested in our lives through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that is made possible when, when we are seeking first the kingdom of God and we are surrendering ourselves daily to the kingdom of God. You know what the byproduct will be? Will be the righteousness and the peace and the joy. I described it like this. Uh, Steve was in the car the other night and I told the Sunday school class this and my aunt was in the car and we were, I was talking about how I think grace is and I have these beautiful irises in in my front yard not because I planted them but the lady that uh, way back when had the house she planted them and they come up every year the thing about these irises I they're beautiful but it's so sad to me because I go I have to get out there and watch it and you have to be there when it blooms because they quickly fade away but so all in the course of a day these irises went from like being the bud to blooming. Now, several observations that happened. One is those irises bloomed on their own just by being in the sun. Just by be, being grounded in that soil and being in the sun and having received the water, those irises throughout the day just naturally opened up. And the interesting thing was, and I told this in the Sunday school class, I didn't hear this sound. Ah, ah, ah. Like, I didn't hear any birth pains. I didn't hear anybody struggling. Like, those flowers just kind of, they just opened up. And I believe that that's what it is, that's what grace is in our lives. That when we are just allowing ourselves to be exposed to God's grace. See, that's a big thing. We don't allow ourselves to be exposed by God's grace because we don't like the idea of being exposed. 
But when we allow ourselves to be in the light as He is in the light, when we allow ourselves to take in that grace, what will be the natural byproduct is we will be like that flower and we will simply start blooming. And it's a blooming that doesn't require these rules. See, I never, the flowers didn't go like, okay, I can only grow this much over here and only this much over here and I can only do this, I can do that. The flowers just bloomed. Life just happens when we allow it to happen. Grace becomes amazing when we are willing to allow it to be amazing in our lives. When we are allow, willing to allow the sunshine to infect all of our lives so that we are truly affected by it. So what Jesus is getting at in the Sermon on the Mount is that God is not concerned so much with these outward appearances as he is concerned about the matters of the heart. Because we all know this. You're sitting in here, and I'm up here, and we all got dirt in our hearts, don't we? We all got it. We all got stuff, and we all try to hide it. Jesus tells us that you can't hide it from God. He knows what's in there, and so you might be able to follow the, the letter of the law, but your heart can be far from where you actually are. Just like you could be sitting here in this pew, and some of you are already eating lunch in your brain. Some of you are already taking your Sunday afternoon nap right in the pew. <laughs> or you might be planning that nap later on. But you know that you can, that's one of people's problems is that they are not present in the present. Anybody know that? When you get yourself in trouble, that's because you're not present in the present there. But Jesus wants us to be present where we are at. And he wants our hearts and our minds and our souls and our spirits to all be connected so that there aren't these separation and these silence and that they are all under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, all under the reign of the Heavenly Father who loves you. Remember, that's why he's, he's wooing, he woos us in and he says, as he woos us in, but don't let yourself get trapped by this law stuff. Because unless you're going to be, and he's being sarcastic when he says, unless your righteousness is like the Pharisees, you're never going to get in there. He's being sarcastic there, okay? And he's saying, you know, you can't be like these guys. Don't think they, don't try. See, that's the wonderful thing. If you can't beat them at their own game, create a new game. And I believe that that's what God actually does. Not that he's creating a new game, but that he's putting us on the game, he's putting us on the path that he had established all along. And so it seems like a new thing, but it's actually quite an old thing. God wants to change our hearts because our hearts are where the problem is. That's why Jesus says, you've heard it said, do not commit murder. But I tell you, if you're angry, you've committed murder. Do not commit adultery. But if you look at someone lustfully, you've committed adultery. How many of you have committed adultery? Just saying. I mean, you look at me every Sunday. How could you not? <laughs> but Ecclesiastes 9.3 says, This is the unfortunate thing about everything that happens on earth. The same fate awaits everyone. The hearts of all the people are full of evil. And there is madness in their heart during their lives. Then they die. Kind of a depressing way to put it. The Bible also tells us that the heart is deceitful and wicked and no one can understand it. That's why when people say follow your heart, it's the dumbest thing that they could ever tell you. Whenever you followed your heart, hasn't it nine times out of ten been the dumbest thing that ever happens there? Everybody around you telling you you're heading for disaster. Your brain even tells you you're heading for disaster, but you're following your heart because that's what a Hallmark movie told you to do. What you don't know is Hallmark has stock in Xanax. <laughs> they want you to follow your heart so then you get all anxious and then you make dumb decisions and now you're on antidepressants, Xanax and everything. I don't actually know if they're connected there. Just a funny ha-ha. All right. Jesus tells us in Matthew 15, verse 18, but the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart and these things defile a person. In the context, Jesus is saying it's not what goes into us that defiles us, but it's what comes out of us that defiles us. Because where do all these things come from? It comes from our heart. You know where we are by the fruit that's produced in our lives. Bad trees produce bad fruit. 
Good trees produce good fruit. And so what, and all those things come out of the heart and whether or not our hearts are connected to God. So it is very possible to look like you have fruit, but it might be artificial fruit. It might be the plastic fruit that people put out on their table for decoration that you got hanging from your, from your tree branch. But when we come up to that fruit and we try to eat it, it's plastic, it's fake, it's not real. Because the fruit has to come from a heart that is connected to the Father. Jesus tells us in the Gospel of John, I am the vine and you are the branches. Abide in me and you will bear much fruit. If we're connected, so what's our only job? Our only job is to make sure that we are connected to the vine. To seek first the kingdom of God. Be connected in that relationship. And then I don't have to work so hard. And if I don't work so hard, then I'm not going to be so exhausted. If I'm not so exhausted, I might actually be usable for the kingdom. I might be able to do something rather than always being the victim. How many of us are always the victim? And how many of us are tired about being a victim all the time? How many of us are tired about hearing other people being the victim all the time? You could be the victim or you could be the victor, but it's a matter of what are you going to do? Who are you going to be connected with and where is that source of strength coming from? Where is that reservoir coming from? Are you awake? Say amen. amen. So, what Jesus is getting down to here is whether or not we are following the letter of the law or the spirit of the law. Those are two very different things. The letter of the law says, go to church on Sunday. The spirit of the law says the Father is seeking worshipers that d will worship Him in spirit and in truth. That will worship, worship Him authentically with the, all that they have, with all that they are. The letter of the law just follows details. But the spirit of the law what is this understanding of whether or not we truly get it. You know, uh, this week is final exam week for, uh, for five classes I'm teaching. It's been a little insane over this past uh, couple weeks there. But it's final exam week. And it is very possible that students will be able to pass the exam and graduate without knowing anything. Just look at how much stupidity is out in the world. And they all got degrees behind them. Because you know what it's like. So, if you've ever had to cram for a test, how many of you have crammed for tests? Any time in your life. This is what happens, because you, you have multiple tests, so you've got to cram for this test and that test. You shove it in your head, and you just hope that you can vomit it back out on the paper, and then you're like an Etch-a-Sketch, you shake your head, and then it's all gone. Well, that's, that's the way we are with God's law, right? You know, it's like we try to shove everything in there, and we totally miss the point. We totally don't pass the test because we didn't actually learn anything. We just went through the exercise of it. And I always think to myself, what a waste. Like I tell the students, why are you sitting here? Just like I tell you, why are you coming to church? If you aren't taking anything that you hear from any of this stuff and applying it in your life, if you're just sitting there and thinking through osmosis is going to like absorb into you, I got another thing coming for you. It ain't working. Because Jesus also says, you are the salt of the world. You are the light in this world. This world is supposed to be better because you're in it. If you, there's problems in this world, you know who's to blame for it? Us. Because we've done nothing to address it. I was telling the Sunday school in the class this morning that, that I was sitting at home thinking about you know, poverty and the things, the, the issues that face this community. And I go, and how many people are going to church on Sunday and sitting there singing their hymns? Yeah, those numbers are dwindling, and there's a reason why they're dwindling. Because there's no life. Things that die, they die because there's no life. The absence of life is death. And so the numbers dwindle because we're just sitting there keeping it on life support. It, it looks like it's breathing. It looks like it's alive. But it ain't doing anything. We're just a body on life support. And if there's a problem in this world, that's where the people of God are supposed to be. We're supposed to run into the burning house to get people out. We are responsible. That's what Jesus is saying here. 
But that will only happen when we understand that it's not a matter of the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. And what is that spirit of the law? Well, Matthew 23, I love the, the seven woes of Jesus uh, because uh, Jesus is one of these guys. that he, There's a reason why they put him up on the cross. He ticked them off. It was a teaching that, that he was reminding them, again, you're missing the point. Listen what he says. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. Now, that always gets you. I mean, like if I start off, a, woe to you, all you hypocrites, and start off my Sunday morning sermon. Um, you give a tenth of your spices, mint and dill and cumin. Let me put that in modern day term. You tithe. Good for you. We'll take your money. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. That's because what we, what we end up doing is we pick out the stuff that, that we're able to do. Like, I, I, I love when I actually talk to people that get into tithing and they, they just think it's the best thing ever. And I go, and now what's next? Because God didn't stop with tithing. And let me tell you something, when God told me 10%, I was I did that whole thing. I went, well, God, I serve the church. Doesn't that count? And God went, no. Okay, so then I started to my 10%, and then God goes, well, why don't you now give to this and give to that? But I've already given. Keep on giving. Keep on doing. Because God doesn't want any boundaries, any barriers. He wants us to be free to his leadership. And, but how many of us have put barriers on what we'll allow God to dictate in our life? We all have it. God, you can touch here and here, but you cannot touch here. I used to be like that. That's where I said, God, uh, I'll go anywhere that you want me to go as long as I have a queen-size bed and air conditioning. And then God sent me to Kenya where I had a twin bed, a mosquito net, and no air conditioning. And then I said, God, I'll, I'll do anything, but I prefer not to get my hands dirty. And then God had me wash a homeless person's back and do all this stuff. And so every time I told God what I wasn't going to do, he pushed a little bit farther. He's always pushing. And if God, if you're not feeling that God's pushing, that's because you stopped responding. Amen. That's what happens when you stop responding. It's not that God hasn't stopped moving. It's that you've stopped moving. And that train is going to keep on going whether you're going to get on it. You're either going to be on the train or run over the train. But the choice is going to be up to you. And so we can do, you know, but the people that do that, like that, that 10%, then they get all excited and then I go, well, then what are you doing to serve other people? What are you doing to alleviate poverty? What are you doing to house the homeless? What are you doing to stand up for justice and mercy? All the weightier matters. of it. Because if you think that tithing is a weighty matter to God, then actually read the book. There's over 2,000 passages that deal with our responsibility for justice and our responsibility to help the poor. And there's only a couple passages that deal with tithing. And here's the thing, if you're not faithful in little things, you ain't going to be faithful in the big stuff, church. You're not going to get your body out of church to get on here on a Sunday morning. That's where half of the people are right now. They're like, I don't feel good. I got allergies. Well, I got allergies too. Take a clarity and get over it. But if you're not going to be faithful in those little steps, you ain't going to be faithful in big steps. You're not going to be able to experience the, the power of God that moves mountains into the sea because you can't move your thigh out of bed. Right? I mean, think about it. So, and then, but we go, oh, but I'm good because I did, I did my little tithe and I did this and I did that. And you know what? Here's the thing. God is not up there counting your good deeds. He's not up there putting little stars by your name and going, up, oh, Valerie, you got four stars today. Good job. <laughs> because the, the thing was, go back to the Beatitudes, God has already established how he thinks about you. He loves you. You are blessed. He's already, he, he now, because you're blessed, he would like you now to live like you are. And what is that? Blessed people are generous. Blessed people are giving. Blessed people are powerful. Blessed people are doing things because they know that they're blessed. They know that, hey, God's got it. I'm good, right? Hap blessing is happy, fortunate, and to be envied. 
So what is the spirit of the law? Well, 1 Samuel 15, 22, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. God isn't interested in all those good deeds and all that stuff unless it's coming from a spirit of obedience. A spirit of obedience that, and why do we obey? Well, you know, when I got both of my parents here, so when I was younger, see, now I get to pick on them together. <laughs> but when I was younger, when I, when I would be bad, what happens when you're bad and you're a kid? You get punished for it. And that's why you, that's why you don't do something bad and why you try to do something good, because you get a punishment or a reward, right? I mean, to be able to make a poopy in a toilet, you get a cookie. You got to pro. You got to get the kid to like change. So make a poopy in the toilet so that you don't make it in the bathtub, which I did one time. Uh, it's water and it's porcelain. What do you want from a kid, right? But you 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 get the kid through a series of reward and punishment. Isn't that kind of what the law was? Reward and punishment. But you know what? Eventually, the punishment isn't enough. My mom used to have the wooden spoon. That was a family trait. It was handed down from generation to generation to generation. And it was the threat. I just had to have that wooden spoon on me one time to know that the threat of the wooden spoon was enough to keep me in line. And my mom would do the one, two. And when you know you got to two, that's when you have to change your ways. Because you didn't change your way at one. You held on just a little bit longer. Isn't that what we do with God? Right? We hold on until I have to change, I won't change. Until you're sending me to hell, I won't change. Two and a half. That's what we're all waiting for God to say. Two and a half, and then it's okay. But right, that, that's what parents do now. And then they're like two and three quarters. Come on, kid, I don't want you to call Child Protective Services. Please change. But you get these parents that do that. But eventually, what happens was, my, my, my rear end got bigger than that wooden spoon. And no longer is the wooden spoon going to be able to do anything to me. It's not going to change me. It doesn't do anything. In fact, I used to have to force out a tear when I got slapped or do something, because if I didn't, then it was worse. Then she, you know, then you know, one time my body, my mom had me in. The, you know, she slapped me for something. I was mouthing off. I deserved it. And I don't know whatever happened. I had this reflex, and a fist went up. Oh my! <laughs> Somehow my body, my head was on the other side of the room and never left my body over here. Like you, you will never do that to me. Never do that again. So, my mama taught me there. But here's the thing. When, when you get older and you, get, you, you see how much your parents love you, then that should start changing why you obey them. You obey them because you don't want to hurt them. You obey them because you love them. And that love is stronger than any reward or punishment that the law could ever offer. That's why Jesus came. He came to show us God's love so that we would be wooed by love. And that's why the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You've got to fear. That's why parents, you've got to do it when they're early and young. Whack them on their hiney. Don't, don't touch your face, but give them a little smack in the tush. It's okay. But smack them in the tush when they're young so that when they're older, they will already have the fear. But then the Bible says, perfect love casts out fear. So it starts with the fear of the Lord, but then perfect love casts out the fear. It started with the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not. Then it went to Jesus who said, thou shalt be. That's how, that's how it changes the whole thing. And then love becomes the motivating force. And love is so much stronger than fear of punishment. Because here's the thing about fear of punishment. You've got to get caught. Right? My mama's wooden spoon only did it when my mama's eyes were around. Because I remember this. I remember learning the F-bomb. And I learned that, you know, right, repetition 
is the way that you don't forget things. And I didn't want to forget that word that I learned. <laughs> so I marched up and down the street with my best friend outside shouting the F-bomb because I didn't want to forget it. My father caught me one time, I wrote another curse word down and I wrote it down and I put it in a drawer in my desk and I remember him saying, Robin, why did you write this word down? And I said, so I wouldn't forget it. <laughs> right? You don't, right? You never know when you're going to have to have that word handy and go, you know what? I have something to say to you. There you go. Right? You never know when you're going to need to have that. But I was out there, I remember out there cursing on the street and then my stepfather came walking out. Uh-oh. And then I had to wash my mouth out with soap. Now don't do that to your kids. But you know what? I taught them. This is what I did. They go, you have to pick out your own bar of soap. There was the cheap soap, and then there was this oil of Olay stuff. And it looked expensive, and it came out of an expensive box, and I went with the most expensive soap that there was, and I grinded it down. And they go, we think your mouth is clean. No, it's not, because you are not using this $4 bar of soap ever again. <laughs> Don't make me do that. But do you see their spirit of rebellion? Now you're all laughing at that, but is that not how we are when it comes to any type of fear and punishment and all that stuff? We're gonna still do what we can do to be right even when we're wrong. Jesus wants us to understand it's not about being a matter of right and wrong anymore. It's a matter of being chosen, being blessed and being in that and allowing the spirit to produce in there because eventually those punishments, they're not enough to keep you in check, but love is. Hosea 6.6 6 says, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Again, we see this hierarchy of God looking for justice and mercy and faithfulness. How does this all come about? It all comes about through new hearts and renewed minds that then leads to transformed lives. So it starts inside and then it begins working its way out. You know, those irises, they were working on blooming even during the winter. There was something going on and I just didn't see what was going on, but they were getting ready all winter long. God's doing that inside of us all the time. Do you ever feel that? Like stuff start rearranging? All of a sudden you're not mad at people so much. You're not harboring so much bitterness because, you know, God's doing that spring cleaning. And here's the thing. You could tell God he's not getting into this area. He's getting in. He's getting in. He's going to be checking. He's going to be snooping around. Ezekiel 36, 26 tells us that God gives us a new heart and he puts a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Here's the thing. God wants to remove it, but are you going to let it go willingly? Or are you going to be like the iris out front going, ah, and be the victim? I'm a victim. Or do I want God to go ahead and perform the surgery so that I can be better? Go ahead and remove it. I'm going to trust that you give me a new heart. Because this old heart is crummy. This old life is crummy. This old attitude. And then here's the thing. Then that love creeps in. And this is what it tells us in John 13, 34 through 35. A new command I give you. I love the fact that Jesus only really gave us one new command. See, people, you can look at the Sermon on the Mount and go, well, it says a lot there, doesn't it? But he wasn't giving us a new command. Then he's just kind of exposing the problem of us with laws. But now he gives us a new command. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Here's the thing. You can't love one another as he has loved us if you have not experienced that love. If you have not allowed that love and surrendered to that love, you cannot give away what you don't have. Just like the two greatest commandments are love the Lord your God with all your mind, soul, and understanding and love your neighbor as you love yourself. The reason that we have this new command is because we didn't understand who God was. So we didn't understand who we were. And then we could never give away what we didn't have. We could never love our neighbor as we love ourselves because we didn't love ourselves. So that's why Jesus establishes a new command. Because he says, now that you've seen me, 
If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I love you. I'm giving my life for you. This is what you do for one another. Not because you have to, but because I did it and you want to be with me and in me. You know me. I don't call you, you call me teacher and rightly so, but I call you friend. That's what Jesus says, I want to call you friend and I want you to follow me. I want you to do it just because you love me. And you, you know why we love him? Because he first loved us. You, when you love him, I mean, you know when you fall in love with somebody, you are mushy as all get out and it is disgusting. <laughs> My friends, we should be oozing disgusting love everywhere we go for God. We should just be oozing that because the more I grow in how much he loves me and more I understand, wow, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Not you, not you, not you, not you, not me. Not death, not life, neither things present nor the future, nor things to come. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Wow, now I'm free. See, isn't that the thing? Jesus came to set us free. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. We're only free when we understand that we're not under the restraint of the law, but we are set free to love as he has loved us. So, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. All these things are make, make sure that you don't get defined by the dysfunction in your world around you. Make sure your heart stays right. Your heart stays with God and be transformed. I like what it says in the message translation on verse 48. In a word, what I'm saying is, everybody say that with me. Oh, you guys, are you awake? In a word, what I'm saying is, your kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward others the way God lives toward you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message. We thank you for Jesus. Oh, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his love. The love that never fails. The love that never ends. God, may that love consume us. Transform us and renew us. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's a few reasons why people don't go to church. I can't come to church until I get my life together. Church is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And there's always room for one more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not about my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, the code is wear some clothes. Church. It just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first, and then I felt right at home. I'm not sure I believe everything that you believe. But you can still belong. Church is for wimpy, girly men. You want to say that again? If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't want me. If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't be worried. You can come to my church even if you were brought up Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Mormon, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Southern Baptist, a little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please, come to my church. Where nobody's perfect. Where beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional. But grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. Where hope is alive. And where it's okay to not be okay. Really.